Good evening to people dialing in from the Americas and good morning everyone from Hong Kong. Uh, my name is Mario Dinsey and I'm one of the co-chairs of HK45, at least for another day or so before we hand over to the incoming committee. Um, HK45 is very pleased and proud to present this event today, which is our first event in our second virtual fireside chat series showcasing female talent in arbitration. We are incredibly privileged to have borrowed some of the precious time of Claudia Benavides, who will be chatting to my fellow HK45 co-chair, Kieran Sangera. Kieran is the Business Development Deputy Director of HKIAC and is really a driving force behind HK45. I'll leave it to Kieran to introduce Claudia, but before I do, um, allow me a couple of words on HK45. As most of you probably know, this is the HKIAC's group for the young and young at heart arbitration practitioners. We're very active in Hong Kong and the APAC region, and we're represented around the world by regional ambassadors. We organize events, publish a newsletter, and generally aim to, get, to bring together young arbitration practitioners to network, but also to learn from more senior practitioners such as this event today. One of our core aims is to promote diversity in international arbitration, which is why we are so proud of the Fireside Chat Series. We think this type of event is so important to raise awareness about the opportunities for both women and men in arbitration and to seek inspiration and advice from women who are really at the top of their field. Our first virtual fireside chat series was a great success. And in this second series, in addition to Claudia, we also look forward to hearing from Catherine Munn, Natalie Reed, Sapna Jangiani, and Yaz Banafatimi. We would also encourage you to register for those events in course, in due course as well. HK45 membership is open to everyone under the age of 45. It's free and we encourage you to join. You can follow us on LinkedIn and you can also apply via the website. It would be remiss of me not to say that this second fireside chat series was Kieran's brainchild and she put it together from start to finish. So a special thank you is also due to her here. Thank you very much for watching and listening in. I'm looking forward to a very interesting and inspirational chat and I'll hand the rest over to Kieran. Great, thank you so much, Marielle. Um, it's actually been a huge pleasure working with both you and Duncan Watson, uh, fellow co-chairs on, on this project, the first series and the second, um, and of course, with the wider HK45 committee. So thank you, um, thank you for that. Um, but let's get down to business. Um, so here we are today. I am so excited and so, so pleased to be interviewing um, Claudia Benavides the global chair of the disputes practice of Baker and McKenzie. Claudia is based in uh, Bogota, Colombia, which is her hometown. She's joining us uh, from there this morning or in Claudia's case this evening. Um, I hope she has a glass of wine tucked away somewhere there. Um, I certainly would. I have a coffee here. So I think next time we're definitely swapping the, uh, the time slots. Um, but you know, the. It's a pleasure to have you, uh, Claudia. It's really, I'm just delighted that you've accepted. Um, a bit of background. So I first met Claudia in February, 2013. Um, I was representing HKIC at a conference organized in uh, Bogota together with the then Secretary General Chan Bao. Um, I then basically followed Claudia around various conferences in Latin America for about two years. Um, but I have to say, uh, really from the first time we met, you'd left such an impression on me. I was so confident, instantly approachable, clearly knowledgeable, so, so charming and a lot of fun. Um, Claudia was also very interested in Asia uh, and interested in the opportunity to know more about HKIC. Um, and the culmination of that, uh, which you will remember very well, was a road trip uh, at the end of 2014, together with some other Latin American practitioners where uh, we visited, they came to Hong Kong and we went to Shanghai and Nanjing. And um, probably one of the most um, fruitful, unpredictable and enjoyable trips I've done to date. And um, probably the start of uh, many jokes. <laughs> Uh, what do you do when you see a Mexican, Argentinian, Brazilian, Chilean and Colombian turn up in a Shanghai bar? Um, that's not one of the questions, Claudia, but we'll save that for another day. Um, but I, what I will say, uh, and I'm sure it's not the first time, but Claudia was um, the only senior female partner on that trip. Um, and we'll hear more about her experiences in that regard soon. In terms of her practice, uh, it's a diverse arbitration practice. Um, largely focusing on high value disputes in a variety of sectors, including construction and infrastructure projects, 
M&A, Energy general and General Commercial Matters, and she's worked with uh, most of the major arbitration institutions globally. Um, her experience is with parties, uh, as you would expect from the Americas, but also Europe and Asia, including mainland China. She studied law in Colombia at the Universidad de los Andes, and she was called to the Colombian Bar in 97. She also gained an LLM from the London School of Economics and Political Science. Fast tracking a bit, in 2010, she became the head of the dispute resolution practice in uh, Colombia. In 2018, chair of the Latin American dispute resolution practice of the firm. And in 2019, she became the global chair of Baker McKenzie's dispute resolution group. She also has a strong commitment to diversity. She's a member of the firm's global diversity and inclusion committee chair of the Latin American Diversity and Inclusion Steering Committee of the firm, and also a member of the Latin American Steering Committee of the Equal Representation in Arbitration Pledge. So Claudia, welcome back, albeit virtually to Asia. Um, you're the first Latina featured in the series of these HK45 uh, virtual fireside chats. And um, thank you again so much for joining us. And um, so with that, uh, I think we can get going. Uh, I'm sure everybody's very keen to hear from you. So let, let's start um, at the beginning. Uh, you went to study law at the Universidad de los Andes. Um, did you always know that you wanted to be a lawyer or, and what, motiv mo what motivated you to, to, to take this route? Thank you, Karen. Well, first of all, thank you so much for your very kind words and that introduction. I'm delighted to be here today with, with you. Um, so thank you again for the invitation. Um, I, I didn't always know that I want to be a lawyer, that I wanted to be a lawyer, to be honest. Um, to get to the decision of studying law came after, the decision came after a, a what I would call a thoughtful process. Um, in Colombia, once you finish high school, immediately after you go to university. What that means is that when you're 18 years old, you have to decide what your career is going to be. And you have to decide if you're gonna be an engineer, a lawyer, an economist. At the time, I knew I loved and liked certain qualities that lawyers have or certain things that lawyers do, like uh, debating, defending my point of view, reading, writing, studying, learning new things. And of course, the sense of justice, that I knew. But I also liked other things that um, I didn't relate that much to being a lawyer. I didn't associate those things with being a lawyer. Like for example, uh, participating in negotiations or, or doing business, interacting with the external world, uh, international exposure. I thought those were things that were not that much associated with being a lawyer. So, um, I didn't think that being a lawyer could bring me all that I wanted. However, when I was in a career fair, there was a, 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 a very well-known lawyer participating in that career fair, providing advice to high school students. And I sat down and spoke with him and we were discussing what should I study? And then he started to explain that a, a career is really important to provide you with the tools uh, that you need to approach life somehow. A career should give you a structured way of thinking. And he said, law is one of those. The career such as law would really provide you with those tools that you would use your entire life to approach life and to uh, resolve issues. So, so I started to think more about law as an option. And when I discovered that at Universidad de Los Andes, which is the place where I studied, it was possible to basically major two different, uh, to do two majors at the same time, I decided that I was gonna do law and then in parallel economics. So I did both, because I thought that by doing both, then my interests would be all covered. <laughs> and, and that's what I did. So instead of doing five years of law and then five years of economics, I did five years of law plus, I guess, another year uh, finishing the, 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 the courses that were pending for, for economics. And that's how it happened. <laughs> yeah, and has the economics served you? I imagine it would have done, um, given the business aspect and, you know, 
the numbers uh, and just understanding how business and commerce works? Well, I, I think it, it, it has. Um, I, I, I haven't worked so much doing something that relates directly to economics, but everything that I do relates indirectly to economics. So mm -hmm. if you, for example, about damages, <laughs> which is what we claim in our litigation, then everything that I studied back then, a lot in what I'm doing right now to understand when I sit down with experts, for instance, with damages experts, to really understand uh, how to, what are the damages that uh, our clients actually suffered and how to claim for those, it really helps a lot. That plus many other things. I do think that both law and economics complement each other very much. Yeah. And then you, you so you finished your, um, I guess, your undergrad in, in law and economics, and then you went to London. So you went to London to do your LLM. Um, what was the reason for that? Why London? Um, what motivated that decision? Well, for, for, for me, doing the LLM abroad implied mostly a life experience. That's what I was looking for. So the LLM was important, yes. <laughs> The, what I was going to um, learn doing that LLM was important, yes, but to me, the most important part of it all was the life experience. And certainly London was the place for that life experience. Multicultural, cosmopolitan, sort of an endless city, museums of all sorts, exhibitions or concerts from all over the world, restaurants from the most exotic places, right? Books, music. London is a place where you can actually find the entire world there. Right. So, um, so, so to me, <laughs> the LLM in a place like London was very appealing. And if in top of that, you do your LLM at LSE, one of the world's best schools, then what else can you ask for? <laughs> and certainly it was, it was, it was to me one of the most uh, enriching and joyful and uh, rewarding experiences. Yeah, and you did very well at your studies too, so um, an absolute bonus. <laughs> um, just, just thinking about then, um, you know, your upbringing and, and the, the, decision, the decisions you made, um, was there any uh, strong influence or who, who would be the people or the person that influenced you most growing up? Well, I guess three persons, and two of them are very obvious, but they did influence me quite a lot, both my father and my mother, but then in addition to them, also my grandmother. My, my father, we, we, we used to play a lot together, and, and I think that thanks to him, I, I kind of develop a structured way of thinking, or so I think. <laughs> what sort of games are you playing? That sounds pretty advanced. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that was a very important influence from my father and also certain pragmatism, not to overcomplicate things too much. And I, and I think that's thanks to my father. My, my mother was, of course, a great role model for me. Uh, tenacity, responsibility, autonomy, and, and overall, I would say, strength of, of mind and character. Mm. And then, and then my grandmother, I think she was an exceptional woman and um, her, 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 her life was very interesting. And she brought to me all that, all those interest, interesting aspects of her life. Um, but, I, but, I, but I would say that in terms of how she influenced me, I, I think her determination, her self-confidence and her brilliant interpersonal skills were, were, were things that influenced me a lot. Not that I have, all of them, <laughs> but I'm just saying that those were a great influence for me. Yeah, well, I think you do. Um, I think when you describe both your mother and your grandmother, there are certainly things that I would associate with you um, in leaps and bounds. So you, you can see that you've had some really positive um, female role models, as well as your father, of course. And I think that just underscores how important um, that can be. Um, Agreed. Yeah, what, one of the things just to note for the audience is there, it won't, it doesn't have to just be me asking the questions. If you do have questions, please use the Q&A icon that should be on your screens, um, you know, and put any of your questions to Claudia, uh, and we'll hope to get to some of those um, at the end. 
Um, pivoting now to your um, to your career, so we know where you are today, but how did you start out? Um, can you tell us a bit about your early career? Sure. So, so my first job was in a small firm in Colombia, in Bogota. They were correspondents in Colombia for PNI clubs, for protection and indemnity clubs. So that 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 means that what I was focused on was mostly maritime law, insurance law, and insurance litigation. That's that's basically what I what I did at the time. I was I, I spent there for four years. My, my, my first four years, the first four years of my career. And it was and it was a great experience because working in this small firm opened for me lots of really important opportunities. So, so at a very early stage of my career, I was able to go to court, to cross-examine witnesses, to participate in hearings, to define the strategy of a case, to have direct and constant interaction with, with clients and to have also that international exposure because the, the, the PNI clubs, most of them were based in the UK, some others in, in, in other parts of Europe and, and North America, but most of them were in the UK. And I had to interact with them all the time, plus the clients in Colombia. So from day one, I had this great experiences that were challenging, that of course uh, implied huge responsibilities for me, but I'm very thankful to the firm because they allowed me to assume those responsibilities and, and uh, gather this experience that otherwise I think I, I, I wouldn't have. So it was, it was a great way to start <laughs> my professional life yeah, and I think um, I think you often hear those those folks who who may have started out at a different, not a major international firm, um, and sometimes it's exactly what you describe, where they have um, sometimes a bit more responsibility or certainly smaller teams, and so it's a case of um, sink or swim and 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 get your hands dirty and take ownership of. Um, of the work that you do. And I think that these are, you know, things that I'm sure now, you know, started you off um, really, really on the right track. Um, so you had four years there um, at a smaller firm doing quite specific uh, insurance and maritime work. Um, what happened next? Um, I guess what I'm getting at is how did you then go from that uh, role to um, a major international law firm and were there any steps in between? Right. So, so right after my my work at this at this firm, I I went to London to do the LLM. So mm -hmm. that was right after. And then when I came back, I worked for for one year as full time professor at Universidad de los Andes, where I studied in the Faculty of Law. I was teaching contracts there, and I, I loved it. I just, I just, I just love the fact that I was working at the university, studying again, being with students, uh, the creative atmosphere that you feel in, 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 in an educational environment and, and, and everything around it. So I was really enjoying my time there. I worked there for one year. And while I was working there, I met a, a dear good friend of mine who was working at Baker McKenzie at the time. And, and he said, Claudia, right now there's um, a position uh, vacant within the dispute resolution practice group at Baker McKenzie, would you be interested? And I was really enjoying my time at Universidad Los Andes. <laughs> so so uh, I told him, well, tell me a little bit more about the firm, about the job. And he said, well, I I in reality, what I want to tell you is that you have a profile that is rare to find. In, in Colombia at the time, it was not common to, to see, to, to have uh, litigators or lawyers with experience in litigation that were bilingual, that spoke English, and that at the same time had uh, done an LLM abroad. It was not common. It was not a common profile. 
So, and, and I guess that it was that most of the lawyers that had that profile were not litigators. <laughs> they were most focused on m a or corporate or other areas of law, but not litigation. And, and he said, I, I really encourage you to, to apply uh, to, this, to this position. You're going to love it. And I said, okay, so let's take the, 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 why not? Let's take this opportunity. And I applied and I, and I got the job. Um, and I'm so thankful to my friend <laughs> that he reached out to me and he told me about this position. And uh, the, so happy that I applied because it, it certainly um, had been, again, a very rewarding experience being able to work in a firm like Baker's. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think what I already I'm sort of hearing is that um, you may not have always known the exact path or, or the route, um, but you took opportunities as and when um, they arose. Um, and yeah, most certainly in most, people I, most people's eyes, it's, it's paid off. Um, so in terms of the team that you joined um, in Baker, uh, you know, a few years ago, we won't say how long. Um, <laughs> And the team that you have today, uh, how has the team changed in terms of its composition? Um, were you, you know, were you one of the only females at the time, or, or was it already um, fairly common to have uh, female lawyers in, in these types of firms? Well, the composition has changed a lot at the time. Several years ago, <laughs> many, <laughs> I was I, I was actually the only woman in the team. Hmm. Um, all my colleagues uh, in the dispute resolution practice group in Bogota were, were male. The partner leading the team was male. The senior associates were male. My ju the junior associates were male. Everyone was, 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 was male. <laughs> um, so I was, I was, I was the, first, um, the first woman in the team. Things have evolved, importantly. So I was... Um, first asked to head the group. And that was the first time that a woman was mm -hmm. leading the team. I was, I was um, promoted to partner. And then after a few years of my promotion to partner, I supported another of my colleagues, also a female, to become the second partner of our practice group in the Bogota office. Mm -hmm. so, so currently it's, it's two women leading the disputes practice in the Bogota office. And our team is, I would say, very much gender equal. So, so we have both uh, associates, men and women, um, more or less 50-50, and that may change a little bit from time to time. But we do believe that having gender equality is, is, is the best composition that we can have. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing. So it's changed that. a lot. Yeah, no, it certainly sounds like it. Um, I, and it's really, it's, it's really good um, and inspiring and um, valuable to hear that you actually your team um, is female led. And it's not really a conversation about whether it's better led or it's just, in, it's just good to hear that because it's not often the case. Um, so it's great that you, you, you kind of pioneered that and that you supported your your colleague and now it's a, a female um, led team. So um, yeah, really, really good to hear that. Um, so you mentioned a little bit there about um, being promoted to head of the, the practice in Colombia. Um, you've actually had a number of leadership roles and I touched on them in the, in, in the introduction, but um, just to go back there. So leading the disputes team in Colombia was the first step um, and then leading the disputes team for the wider Latin American region and then most recently, um, the chair of the global um, disputes practice. In terms of taking these steps or um, achieving these leadership roles, um, how did those opportunities arise? Or um, you know, were you put forward for these things or did you apply directly? Um, how did that all pan out? Because I think there's people here at different stages of their career listening in. And I think um, we certainly have folks who are looking at the leadership um, track. So I think they'd be interested to hear about how that happened. Right, so, so the, 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 the way it works at, at Baker's is 
because I was heading the Bogota dispute resolution practice group. I was heading the team in Colombia. Then that implied that I was a member of the Latin American dispute resolution steering committee. And I participated in, 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 in that role or I, I had that role for several years, which allowed me to, on the one hand, connect with my partners and colleagues in the region. On the other hand, allowed me also to work together with them in developing our, our business in identifying business opportunities in interacting with clients as a regional team, um, identifying also talent. Um, so, so, so it was, it was in terms of exposure, it, it provided me really great opportunities to interact with the regional leadership, but also with the global leadership. And then as a result of that, when the chair of our steering committee, our Latin American steering committee stepped down, then I was, I was asked by the firm's leadership if I wanted to take that role and chair the LATAM uh, DR steering committee. And, and of course, I, I, I was very pleased <laughs> and, and very honored uh, by the fact that they've asked me to do that. And I said, of course, yes. And then how it works at the firms that they once, once they've uh, identified candidates and they ask the candidates if they have an interest, then they do soundings and they ask the partners um, in the practice group in the region, the, 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 the partners that would have to interact with the person that would take that particular role. So after that process, I was appointed to, to, chair, to chair the uh, Latin American Dispute Resolution Steering Committee. And then when you are the chair of the regional steering committee, then you are a member of the global steering committee for that practice group. So that allowed me to, uh, again, in that capacity, interact with my colleagues, the chairs uh, of the other regions at a global level with the global steering committee uh, as a member of that global steering committee. And again, worked, I worked together with them in many initiatives, developed um, different programs, et cetera, et cetera. And when the chair of that global steering committee was going to step down, then the same process that I explained before happened this time, but for the global role. So it was, it was very exciting, uh, the fact that, um, that uh, they they've identified me as someone who could um, serve our practice group in a meaningful way. Uh, I'm very grateful for that. But then in addition to that, also the fact that uh, this is a process made with soundings with our partners and that they've supported that as well um, was, was it of course, again, uh, very meaningful for me. Yeah, I think um, what I hear there is it was um, the fact that you were able to get that visibility um, and that experience amongst the other heads um, of the Latin American offices. Um, and I think that notion of getting involved, uh, you know, not necessarily on the same track, but in various committees for individuals, just to get themselves exposed and visible um, and working with different types of people can then lead to, to other things. I mean, that's certainly been my experience even here with HK45. So um, I think a uh, key thing, um, again, not just for women, but is, is just having that exposure and, and visibility to the you know, the higher leadership um, decision makers, I think. Um, well, just staying on this theme of, of being the global chair, and I'm going to say global chair as often as I can, because I think it's fantastic. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, how do you manage your uh, many and competing responsibilities? Um, because, you, you know, you've got a lot going on there. True. <laughs> Lots of things going on at the same time. Um, well, I, I, I think there are two key aspects to it. The first one is a very obvious one, which is organization and being able to prioritize, right? To define what comes first and what comes afterwards. That, that is key, organization is key. But another aspect to it that I, 
I found fundamental is uh, teamwork. In the various roles that I have and the different responsibilities that I have, being able to um, assemble teams that are really committed, that are empowered, that really want to achieve uh, the goals that we've set in the best possible way, motivated people, it's, it's just fundamental. So, so to me, the, 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 the way in which anyone can achieve excellent results and be successful in anything <laughs> is by acknowledging that that is achievable only through teamwork. Yeah. And to be able to, 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 to have those kind of teams then uh, being inclusive is really fundamental because that allows people to give their very best, right? When you when you um, bring in um, uh, people to a certain team and you acknowledge that each one of them is bringing great things to the team, is adding value to everything that we're doing, and you empower them, they give their their best, and then you are able as the leader of a team to achieve. <laughs> great results, which are not your results, but the results of the team as a whole, and you're able to deliver what you're supposed to deliver as a result of that teamwork. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, in terms of, uh, again, the role that you have, two aspects to this question. What are the what are the, the things that keep you up at night? Um, I guess that, that, uh, that's, that are the most stressful. Um, and also, what do you enjoy the most? So I, I'm going to start by the last one. I think that one of the things that I enjoyed the most is the fact that in the role that I currently have, I do get to meet lots of people all the time. And I meet just wonderful, brilliant, interesting people all the time. And I enjoy that uh, greatly because it's, it's, it's having conversations that are uh, uh, creative conversations. Every time that you interact with, with someone, then there are new ideas coming in. And then those new ideas that become uh, plans. And then you want to implement those plans and that you get results. But it's all the consequence of having conversations with different people that bring ideas from and, with, and bring different perspectives. So. I enjoy very much that constant contact mm. and interaction with people from different backgrounds, different nationalities, um, different uh, with, with different views about things, but with a couple of things in common. And it's drive, uh, commitment, energy, and also friendliness. So, so uh, it's, it's just uh, fantastic to, to that part of my job I, I love. And what keeps me <laughs> up at night? Um, in, 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 in what we do as, as, as litigators, of course, <laughs> making sure that you're able to deliver on time everything that you have to deliver is one of those things that may keep you up at night. But generally speaking, I think that uh, being able to deliver what you're expected to deliver generally. And uh, that may keep me up at night when the challenge is huge, but then the way I manage that is by, and then that goes back to one of the uh, questions that you asked before, and it's by being very organized. I guess that when you, when you, when you have this big responsibilities in front of you, but you start planning and preparing and doing what you have to do, then that stress comes down because you know you're taking steps to achieve what you want to achieve and to deliver to your clients what you have to deliver, to deliver to your teams what you have to deliver to the firm. So um, so that happens when <laughs> the uh, responsibility is huge, but then I try to immediately take action. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I can see that. And I think as you mentioned when we were chatting earlier, um, given the years that you've been doing that also when when you, your stress levels about deadlines have 
have reduced because you you do know how you, to plan things and how to manage those um, things that might come up at, at the last minute. So your experience obviously contributes to to minimising those um, stress levels. So for those of us at the not us actually I said that for those that are at the junior end I'm not anymore, but I like to think I am. Um, I think it's a, it's reassuring to know that with time, um, you know those those concerns can can fall away with experience. Um, coming on to advice, uh, and I'm conscious of time here, but um, as you know, this series focuses on um, successful female practitioners in arbitration, um, and we talk and think a lot about um, success generally. I'd be interested to hear from you, um, given what you've achieved, how do you define, um, how do you define personal success, or what, what does that mean to you? So... So, 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 so to me, success basically means that every single day you're enjoying what you're doing <laughs> and you feel happy that this is, this is, this is, this is your life. So in other words, if what you're doing, you find that what you're doing is meaningful and because it's meaningful to you, then you enjoy what you're doing and you're enjoying that every day to me. And that's a very personal, of course, definition. For me, that's success. Because, 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 because it means that you, that you feel that your life is that meaningful and mm -hmm. that gives that sense of joy. <laughs> so uh, that's how I would describe it. But then again, that's a very personal <laughs> definition of success. Yeah, but it, again, it's interesting to hear that it's not necessarily that you are the global chair of the dispute resolution practice at, at Baker. It's more of a mindset, actually. Am I happy uh, most of the time? Um, and, you know, that you feel satisfied and um, stimulated and um, that your work makes a difference, uh, whatever that is. So for those trainees who are in the photocopying room, please take that on board. <laughs> Let me let me add something to that because because I think that in every role you are in a position to help others, right? So so you are serving clients, for example. So that's our main purpose as lawyers of a firm like Bakers, right? What we we are focused on serving our clients, but then we're also and then and then that's that's meaningful because you're helping others to achieve their business goals or to resolve their most complicated problems. If you think about it in terms of your teams and um, colleagues, then helping our people thrive, help others succeed, help them develop their careers, that is meaningful to, right? And it, and it provides this joy because <laughs> you feel that what you're doing is contributing to contribute to the communities we live in. Uh, in different ways. So we contribute by the work that we do, but then also with the pro bono work that we um, that we do, or the programs that we have in terms of diversity and inclusion, not only focused on gender, but broader than that, then you are also contributing, again, not only within the firm, but to the communities you live in. So all that, in, in, in my view, is what relates to success. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, one of the things that come, has come up um, during some of the fireside chats that we've done previously, um, and naturally those that focus on uh, female successes, um, for those for those women who have successful careers um, and who also have um, family, children, um, how, how those uh, both you know, very important responsibilities and commitments um, can be juggled and, and um, what's the secret if there is one to having a successful family life and a successful uh, career, in your view? Right, so of course, I don't have the secret. <laughs> I don't. And, and I also have to say that this has been a journey for me as well. Mm -hmm. And it has been a learning journey, I would say. Right. Uh, I, I, I think I didn't do it right from the very beginning when my boy was born. I think I've been learning how 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 to do that. 
And in that learning process and in that journey, one thing that to me has been very clear is the fact that it is critical to have parity in terms of the family responsibilities. Yeah. So, so in, in, in my case, and I'm thankful for that, <laughs> grateful for that, even though that's what, that, that, that's what should always happen, <laughs> but because I know that it doesn't happen all the time, then I'm thankful. <laughs> but it's, it's, it's the fact that my husband, he, he enjoys very much family life and he enjoys being a father to my son and he enjoys being responsible for the things of our house and he enjoys being um, equally responsible the same way I am responsible for our family, right? And, and for our family life. And, and that has been uh, fundamental, I think, because a job like mine implies traveling a lot, for example. And knowing that whenever I'm abroad, my child is perfectly fine because my husband is there allows me to do that part of my job feeling good. I don't feel guilty by the fact that I'm traveling somewhere else. I feel just perfectly fine. My boy understands that I'm traveling for work, that I'll be back. But in the meantime, he feels all right because he's taken care of, he's loved, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So in addition to everything else that I mentioned before in terms of making sure that um, that that your teams are doing well because that's essential to the professional part of, of, of your job and to be able to cope with everything. Teams are essential, as I said before, and organization. In addition to that, that, that would be on the professional side in terms of the family life. Um, having that real partner in life, I guess, is, is fundamental. Yeah. Absolutely. Your, your team at home is strong, um, as you say, because doing it alone or not on a, a fair balanced way would, would make things really difficult. So, um, no, that's, yeah, that's, um, that's really good to hear. And um, in one of the previous uh, fireside chats, a similar comment was made is that it can't work unless you have a, a really wonderful support um, at home. Um, so, yeah. Um, just, just one sort of final um, point, really, in terms of um, advice. I'll just, I'll just group a few things together. So, mentorship is, is, um, I think, very important, whether that's formal or informal. But having those people or that person that you can turn to or who, who can support you is key. Um, so, uh, in terms of, of mentorship, um, did you have that? Uh, and also just to say, um, you know, do you play mentor today and, and what sort of advice or one piece of advice would you be giving to, to a female mentee? So a broad question about whether you were mentored and also whether you do it and any one piece of advice for a female mentee, for example. So I, th th throughout my professional life, I've, I've had mentors in an informal way. So not, not part of a specific program, with a set mentor, no, I haven't had that, but I've, I've had mentors throughout my life, which in an informal way, as I just said, which, which have influenced me importantly and have advised me um, uh, a, again in a, in, a, in a way in which I'm sure has um, had a great impact in my career development. So I do think that mentors are very important. They open your eyes with respect to certain things. They reduce the level of uh, anxiety with respect to others. They recommend who to connect with. They, you know, I, I think that mentors are really, are really key in terms of professional development. They introduce you to certain people. Um, so they, they, they give you feedback, the one that you need and that we all need to develop, which is constructive feedback, right? We need to, we need to hear what we're doing well, but we also need to hear what we need to change. And, and I think that mentors are really fundamental for that. So I've had them informally, and I do think they're fundamental. And I've tried to do the same uh, and in, in, in my professional, throughout my professional uh, life. I've been part of 
more formal programs where I've been either a sponsor or mentor to others, uh, which I enjoy tremendously. Um, especially when you when you see people uh, achieving what they want and then thriving and uh, excelling, it's, it's it's just a wonderful feeling. I I, I love to feel that. <laughs> and so and it's not because of what I've done as a mentor at all. It's because of what they are. But 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 because you develop this relationship with them, then it's 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 great to see that happening. Um, I I. I think that in terms of a, of a specific um, uh, advice, and it goes again, again, I think not only to, to, to female uh, um, um, professionals, but to everyone in general, I would say, I, I think it's always very important to keep in mind that, that it's all about people mm -hmm. and that everything that we do, it's always about people. So who are we serving? It's, it's people. Who are our colleagues? People. Who we interact with? People. Who make decisions about our professional life? People. Mm -hmm. so, so it's all about people. And keeping that in mind, I would say, is very important in terms of our, uh, or of each one's uh, um, uh, uh, professional development. Because sometimes we tend to focus on I need to, I don't know, know the law perfectly well. And yes, of course, of course, we all have to know <laughs> the law and how to apply it and um, recognize what are those soft skills that we need to develop, what is the technicality that we need to be really um, uh, an expert on, et cetera, et cetera. Of course, all that is very important and we need to do that throughout our entire career. But sometimes, people may forget that it's not just about that, that it's mostly about people. And uh, if I think that if you understand that, then um, I think you can have a very successful and meaningful career. Mm. Yeah, yeah, very much so. Um, thank you for that. Um, that's been, um, uh, for me, and I, I'm sure for others, um, hugely interesting and, and there's so much to take away from hearing about your journey and, and your motivations um, and your experience, particularly as a, as a leader. Um, you're not quite off the hook yet. I've got a surprise for you. So um, just to wrap up, you might want that glass of wine now. Um, so just some lighthearted, which you haven't seen, quick fire questions. Just a few, um, just, to, just to wrap up here. So <clears throat> the trick with this, you have to answer really quickly. So don't hesitate. Um, and obviously that way we'll know, um, you know, we'll, we'll know so much more about you. Okay. Are you ready? Let's say I am. <laughs> okay, good start. So number one, work from home or work from the office? Home. Uh-huh. Yeah. Um, holiday at the beach or the mountains? The beach. Dining out or cook at home? Dining out. Mm -hmm. Work from home but dining out. That's very interesting. <laughs> um, Netflix, are you a series binge or an episode a week? Oof. Both? Can, exactly. I was going to say, can I answer both? <laughs> <laughs> um, Mozart or Madonna? Madonna. Ah, yeah. I'm surprised you hesitated. I thought you would be Madonna <laughs> straight away. Um, but I'm going to, the only way, I'm going to confess why I hesitated. And it's because every time that I sit down to review documents and write, then I uh, listen to classical music. So that's why I hesitate. And, and I work and work and work all day, right? Yeah. Now, ever, rather than going to parties. <laughs> so that's why I hesitated a bit. <laughs> Thank you for the clarification. Um, okay, early riser or night owl? So here, I also have to say both. You have to do both. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Oh, this is a very Colombia specific one. So, uh, Gabriel Garcia Marquez or Shakira? <laughs> That's a very 
very difficult one because I've read all his books and I know all of her songs. <laughs> oh, well, I'll let you have both then in that case. Um, <laughs> but wonderful. Hey, hey, look, um, I'm going to I'm going to leave it there um, because we've taken up um, a, a huge amount of your time. Um, but just to say again, an enormous thanks uh, for being part of this and for kicking off the, the second series and also for for sharing your journey and for doing your journey, for being on your journey um, and for being the um, the global chair of a major um, a global chair of the disputes practice of a major firm. I think it's it's really good to see um, and it's really inspirational for, for a lot of us. So thank you for, for being and doing you. Um, and for me personally, it's been a really good reason to get back in touch. So hopefully we'll be able to do um, another road trip soon. Um, but yes, uh, thank you again. Um, thanks to all of those that have uh, tuned in and listened. Um, and we hope to see you at the next fireside chat, uh, which is on the 18th of um, December. Um, but in the meantime, Claudia, just once again, thank you uh, enormously. It's been great. Karen, thank you so much. Delighted to be here. And uh, of course, we need to stay in touch. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.